And I've sort of come to appreciate my own family a whole lot more too, you know. I'm probably praising the Lord more than I ever have. <laughs> but I, um, you know, I feel great. This is a crazy thing. I feel great, but apparently I'm not. And uh, so I'm, you know, we're dealing, we're dealing with it. I, I uh, went to the uh, hospital the other day and uh, the nurse said to me, after she looked at my forms that I filled out about my lifestyle and habits and my history, she said, you're disgustingly healthy. <laughs> she said, you are a typical cancer patient, <laughs> which was a bit of a shock. I've been thinking about it ever since. <laughs> you know, we know Adventists know a lot about health. And, uh, but, um, you know, kind of a bit of a challenge for me. And, uh, but I'm not concerned about it. I really believe everything that happens to us, God has allowed it for our good. He says that. So uh, I do appreciate your prayers and don't stop. And uh, I'm sure the outcome will be a good one. Let's just bow our heads before we uh, get into the message today. Father, we've already prayed, but uh, I just sense uh, that your Holy Spirit is important as we uh, come to your word and think about the words Jesus said to uh, the people in his time. May they be uh, words that we can appreciate today and bring into our lives, to know you better, to love you more, and to uh, be more of a blessing to the people around us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we live in a sad, sick, crazy world, don't we? And uh, we were talking a little bit about it in the lesson this morning, why it's like that, but more and more people these days love their things and use the people around them. You know, that's completely back to front, isn't it? You're supposed to love the people and use the things. But consumerism seems to be the today's religion. Getting as many things that will enhance your life as you can. And unfortunately, even today, you know, I see even in my own family, people treat church like that as a commodity. And if it doesn't fit their lifestyle, they just take it back and get the money back. But um, not only that, you know, the world wants peace, doesn't it? Everyone wants the world to be peaceful, but they don't want the Prince of Peace. And people in New Zealand especially, we wring our hands over the binge drinking, you know, of our young people, the alcohol fueled violence and crime, and you know, a talented young rugby star who can't control his drinking. But, you know, these same people will mock the Women's Christian Temperance Union who fought for a century to try and change the way we drink. And we give knighthoods to brewers. It, it's a sick, crazy world, isn't it? Mary Ann told me the other day about when she was living in Australia and the, and the truckies had a strike. All the trucks were off the road. You know, the milk trucks were off the road. All except which trucks do you think? The beer trucks. They're still running. But we're much sicker than this. You know, there's so, there's so much good in the world as well, isn't there? There's so much good, but there's so much evil. You know, are we schizophrenic? <laughs> we're told that Adam, when he saw the first leaf, fall off a tree after they sinned, mourned as we would mourn for a child that had died. He was so heartbroken that death had entered the world. It was so horrifying to them, you know. But look, think about today. We sit down, we have our dinner, we sit down in front of the television and we're entertained by murder. We can watch murder and enjoy it. Death is so common. God never intended it to be that way. God intended death to remind us of the horror of sin. But our generation are entertained by it. And I think maybe that's why Jesus' death was so startling. You know, the crucifixion, it had to be startling to even get the world's attention. Well, we probably wouldn't have noticed. 
So why is the world so sick? And we learned in our lesson today, let me read it to you. Nigel already read this, but some of you weren't here. The child's parents, this is talking about families, right? The child's parents provide the child with a home and all of life's necessities. They love the child and they have the child's best interests in mind. Their greater experience and wisdom can spare the child much misery if that child will accept their guidance. Some children find this guidance difficult, but it is universally recognized that as long as the child is dependent on parents for necessities, the child is obligated to accept the parents' rules. That's pretty normal, isn't it? In like manner, because we are always dependent on our Heavenly Father for life and its necessities, it's always appropriate for us to accept God's guidance because He is a God of love. We can trust Him to always provide what we need for our good. So the rules, the rules that God gave us when he made the world and made us we've just turned our back on them haven't we the world even though God provides all our necessities we've turned our back on him so you know man knows better all, all attempts at correction seem to be wasted you know and the, <laughs> the politicians uh, wring their hands and they don't know what to do. Some of the world's problems. Let's have a quick look at Proverbs 19.3. The wisdom of Solomon. 19.3. Proverbs 19.3 says, A man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. How true it is, isn't it? A friend of mine said to me one time when I was trying to witness to her, my neighbor, she said, I don't think God's so great. He took my sister. You know? But the sickness in the world will just continue until the cause is addressed, isn't it? We, addressing the symptoms is not going to change anything. And really, the um, sickness in the world is never seen more clearly or truly than in the Middle East. Israel, you know, is right in the middle of that hot bed of violence. They're in a scary environment. They're, most of their neighbors hate them. And, but Israel rejected the Messiah. He did everything he possibly could for his chosen nation. And the history of Israel is a sad, tragic one. Never has Israel known peace since she rejected the Prince of Peace. And we live in a world that, like Israel, has thumbed its nose at their God. Mankind wants to live by his own rules, do his own thing. And now the whole world's in trouble, isn't it? <laughs> the economy's in crisis. The environment's in crisis. Disaster follows disaster. You have problems so big that the leaders of the world don't know what to do. But that's the trouble with humans. <laughs> We have a habit of getting the cart before the horse. Have a quick look at Matthew 4. Just by way of introduction, I loved that Bible reading this morning, the scripture reading in Matthew 5. But just by way of introduction, I just wanted to look at Matthew 4. You know, Israel believed in the Messiah. They believed the Messiah would come. They believed the, the Messiah would deliver them. And they even followed Jesus. Have a look at Matthew 4, 23 to 25. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases. Those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So Israel were following Jesus. 
the Messiah, in large crowds. You know, he was a healer. He was a provider of food. He was the perfect king, wasn't he? <laughs> so how did Jesus react to this fame? Have a look at chapter 5. Knowing all of this fame, Jesus was becoming very famous. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, imagine this crowd anticipating this is the guy, this is the Messiah, he's going to deliver us. Now he's sitting down on the mountain, he's going to tell us how he's going to set up his kingdom and we'll all be part of it. And Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus was announcing his kingdom, wasn't he? He was delivering his manifesto. But, the popular misconception of the Messiah was such that it wholly unfitted the people to receive him. They wanted a military leader, didn't they? Imagine a, a leader like Jesus who, when you got hungry, he could give you food. If you got injured, if your soldiers got injured in a war, he could heal them. You couldn't lose. Imagine yourself sitting in that crowd, you know, waiting, <laughs> expecting the announcement. And Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This wasn't a political speech after all. It wasn't a presidential inaugural. What could Jesus mean? Poor in spirit. I wrote it down from that version that was read earlier. Those people who know they have great spiritual needs are happy. So even Jesus said some crazy stuff. No wonder the world's crazy, eh? Even Jesus said some stuff that seemed crazy. But I think he was talking about attitudes, wasn't he? Poverty, you think about poverty, it's actually in our minds, isn't it? Let me illustrate. There's a great little story that um, you hear on 3ABN radio quite often. And it's, you can hear this elderly lady telling the story. When she was young, she belonged to a family that wasn't wealthy. They didn't have much, but they, it was in one of the small towns in America. And uh, she belonged to a little Adventist church. And one day at church, the pastor called for everyone to... Um, set aside a donation, you know, or to prepare for in about three months' time to bring a donation to help a family in need, you know, a poor family in need. And so she got excited, you know, her family got excited about this. They, they um, did extra cooking, you know, and they did extra gardening and they sewed some things and did a lot of little things they could do to get extra money, you know, to bring this donation for this poor family. And after the three months are over, you know, they really enjoyed doing it. And they put all the money in a jar, you know, on the mantelpiece and watched it grow. And eventually the time, the date came when they had to take the donation to the church and they had $19. And uh, they were so glad to be able to give $19. They got to the church and the pastor gathered up all the donations and gave it to their parents, her parents. This, she was... This was the poor family. <laughs> she was part of the poor family. She had no idea. She had no idea they were poor. So you can be 
actually quite wealthy. If you live in New Zealand, you're part of the rich part of the world. You realise that. We think we're poor. But so poverty isn't really in your mind, isn't it? 